It's an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome you here for today's lectures. Uh, and as our regulars here would know, uh, Flory's researchers are really innovators in brain research. It is absolutely world-leading research that you're seeing. We provide these lectures as a, a way to communicate our findings and our research directly to you. Um, we have a number of other ways that you can keep up with Flory Research if you're interested. We have social media accounts, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'll be live tweeting down the front uh, a little bit later. And we also, we particularly invite you to sign up to our Brain Matters magazine if you're not already uh, on our list. Uh, it comes out three times a year by email or through the post, whichever's your preference. Our next issue is just a few weeks away, and I can tell you uh, a little sneak preview. There's a really fantastic story, uh, this issue. 16-year journey of one of our researchers from an interesting finding in the lab right through experiments, setbacks, and all that science entails to now a world-first uh, trial which will be starting. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, it will also be in the media in a few weeks, we hope. So. Uh, I'm you got the sneak preview today. Um, and we invite you to become a donor of the Flory if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, we are conducting research here in this building, also at the Heidelberg campus. Uh, more than 18 diseases and disorders of the brain and mind. And really to, to drive that home, the thing that I think about every day is 4.7 million Australians every year are affected by one of these. So your contribution can really help us with that. We are recording today's lecture, so I'd ask you to turn your phone off, put it on silent if you've got one with you. The lecture will run for about 45 minutes and will be followed by a brief question time. So on to today's lecture, and having heard a little preview uh, over a coffee last week, I can tell you you are in for an absolutely interesting, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Our speaker, Dr. Terence Pang, graduated from the University of Melbourne, majoring in neuroscience and physiology in 2004. He then undertook a PhD with the Flores Professor Anthony Hannon, investigating Huntington's disease in animal models, during which he discovered that the disease confers a predisposition for developing depression, and he actually identified some genetic uh, contributors for this. Really interesting stuff. He went on to supervise his own students, seeking to understand who, how people who have Huntington's disease may be responding to stress in different ways. But in 2011, the emerging field of medical research called transgenerational inheritance took his interest. And his research since has been a unique combination of neuroscience and reproductive biology, uncovering new knowledge of how stress affects not just ourselves, but potentially also the health of future generations. This novel avenue of research seeks to understand how certain lifestyle choices and our environments can impact on reproductive, mental and physical health at a population level. Uh, as I said, you're in for an absolute treat today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Terence Pang. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to be here. I am very excited to tell you about the research uh, and my personal journey of discovery over the last decade or so. And it's to do with what we have called epigenetic inheritance. And it's the idea that our concerns about health should extend beyond just ourselves as individuals, but rather let's expand our thinking to consider the health and future outcomes our children and our grandchildren. So our journey actually starts about 2,500 years ago with Pythagoras. And you may be curious as to why I've brought up Pythagoras. So Pythagorean philosophy was actually about appreciating and understanding the highly ordered and structured way to life. And Pythagoras could appreciate the close relationship between geometry and numerals and that's how he came up with the right angle triangle and its theorem. But Pythagoreans were also really interested in human life and how individuals came to be. How did we um, 
how, how did we come to form our individual ethos and our souls as individual human beings within society? So they were really interested at, at, at that point in time, given that they didn't know anything about genetics. They were really interested in the concept of the soul and how souls could pot potentially be transferred from one individual to the other. And obviously, without the uh, benefits of microscopes and, and genetics, they, they kind of left it at that for a few hundred years. And the Renaissance really brought about a new way to approaching human health. Um, Leonardo da Vinci has, has, has a whole series of these brilliant anatomical drawings that really shed new light into what it means to be a human being. Forward a few hundred years, that's when we started thinking about how we emerge as human beings through the theory of evolution from, uh, proposed by Darwin. Um, and just to remind you, Darwin was really interested in how different birds uh, within the Galapagos regions evolved to meet different environmental challenges in terms of food availability and how the beaks were sculpted by the seeds and plant life that were available across different islands. A few hundred years later, the Czech um, monk Gregor Mendel then started um, following the principles of scientific rigor, where he basically documented how different strains of pea plants could give rise to very specific lineages of pea pods of distinctive shapes and numbers. So that was really the foundation of modern genetics. And thanks to the discovery of the discoveries of Watson and Crick, we now know the 3D structure of DNA. But despite all the information that we, we gathered about how the environment sculpts our lives and health, how genetics underlies various diseases and susceptibility for, for different conditions, they don't quite fully account for all the variability that we see. So that's where this emerging concept of epigenetics comes in. And it's quite, it, by, by all means, it's a relatively new and young field of biomedical research. However, it, its roots can actually be found in botany, quite interestingly. So the, the biologists were a few decades slow in taking up this new idea. So today's lecture will, will basically get into, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of what epigenetics is. I will then tell you, we're using a few uh, case studies, um, I, I will mention that these are conflict-based case studies, um, of how epigenetic inheritance appears in the human population. And then I'll shift to telling you about what work we have accomplished at the Flory um, in understanding uh, epigenetic inheritance and what our future goals will be. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is basically uh, a means of explaining individual differences without or, in, or in, in the absence of any difference in our DNA structure, our genetics. And that's primarily what the word epigenetics is. It helps to uh, explain how differences can uh, come about. So um, on the right, you can see two monozygotic twin girls. They've got the exact same DNA sequence and structure, and yet one of them suffers from Rett syndrome. So epigenetics is basically going to describe how individuals can traverse and end up at different endpoints in their life. And this concept was first coined by um, Professor Conrad Waddington from the University of Cambridge who interestingly started out his scientific career as an early paleontologist. And then he, he graduated to uh, trying to discover how the nervous system in amphibians actually gives, comes about. Now he started talking about epigenetics at a time when it, it was a boom period for um, uh, genetic studies and DNA. And he actually had to write a letter declaring that he actually believed in genetics and he wasn't conducting heresy. <laughs> Uh, for fear of his future career. That was uh, a huge uh, point back, back in those days, in the 1950s. So in this little schematic here, consider that, in, that little ball as ourselves, as, as in, an individual, and as we traverse the journey of life, we can end up rolling down different paths. 
So the landscape is all the challenges we face, whether it's in the environment or whether it's the genetic uh, role of the dice that we've been dealt. So in our bodies, we have all different stem cells. We all arise from the same ball of cells. And at the end of the day, as we develop and as we age, all these cells choose to go around a different path and, and transform into different cells, whether it's muscle cells, heart cells, nervous cells. In a broader perspective, you can regard that as a journey whereby, depending on where you roll down the, genetic, at the epigenetic landscape, you can either lead a relatively healthy life, you can be faced with health challenges early on in life, or you can you know, go down a relatively smooth path. By the time you get to adulthood or middle age, you then encounter a health condition. So that's the, the basic premise of what epigenetics is, is dealing with. So let me give you a couple more examples. And I really like to use fish as, a, as an example because my early life experiences with my dad, who, is a, who, who was a hobbyist fish breeder, re really inspired me to go down this path of biological research. So consider the guppy. We're quite familiar with, with guppies, the multicolored, brilliantly uh, uh, patterned fish. And yet, at the end of the day, all their color is attributed to three different color cells. Okay, so if you look up here, we have the orange cells, the blue cells, and the black cells. Now, having, being brightly colored and being brilliantly patterned is great because it's great for attracting mates in the wild. However, if a, if, if a predator comes by, you're gonna be the first target. So there's this nice balance and counterbalance between the benefits of having being brightly colored and brilliantly patterned. And at the end of the day, hobbies have actually exploited all these uh, uh, aspects of, of the guppy and have bred different, um, many different substrates of guppy. As you can see, the colors are really brilliant. So this is an example where at the end of the day, despite all the variability in, in patterns and colors, the guppy is still a guppy. Right? And the, the, one of the challenges uh, or the advent of epigenetics is um, the aquaculture has actually started to, to look at the epigenetics and, and what is actually controlling the patterns within the guppy. And they're trying to use it to create new strains. So the other fish example that I like to give is the discus fish. So some of you might have heard that the Pinot Noir is the, the heartbreak uh, grape of, of the wine industry. Well, the discus fish is the heartbreak fish of the aquaculture uh, industry. All right? So this is, a, uh, a, a, this is an Amazonian species. And most of the, the, of the fish that you find in the wild are very plain colored, with no distinctive markings on, on their body. They're very sensitive fish in the sense that if they sense any danger to their life, these black stripes will arise, and that would actually enable them to camouflage within the water weeds. If there's any diff changes in the environment, such as during the seasonal monsoonal seasons, where the quality of the water has changed, these stripes also emerge. But they fade off after a while. The problem is that when hobbyists first uh, started trying to breed these uh, fish in captivity, they weren't aware of the sensitivity of these fish, and the young that were generated started to have these black stripes permanently imprinted on their bodies. So much so that if you go to an, into an aquarium right now, practically every single discus fish has black stripes. And there hasn't been a way to reverse breed them out. So this is an example where uh, you have a, an animal responding to something in the environment, and yet, essentially, it is still the same animal at the end of the day. And we believe that this is how epigenetics is playing a role in the natural history of things. So natural variation comes about, we believe, from the many different sources of, of epigenetic changes. And at the end of the day, it allows us to be slightly different from the next person, despite retaining our human, our, our, our being human. So the reason we study epigenetics is we are hoping that in addition to genetic um, indicators, we will be able to find new biomarkers of health conditions, such as aging, risk for disease, and actually manifesting a disease. So one of the examples that I have up here is smoking. So if you look at the DNA uh, signal 
um, in smokers versus non-smokers, each of this, these individual dots correspond to one specific location in our genome. You will see that there are very few locations within our genome that can actually accurately differentiate people who have smoked to people who have not smoked. That study was in males. If we look in expecting mothers um, and look at the DNA uh, of their infants, you can see that the fact that a mother smoked during pregnancy leaves an indelible mark on the infant themselves. So that is one example by which epigenetics can be applied to identify uh, your parental exposures or their indulgence in certain uh, uh, chemicals, so to speak. But the, the focus of my talk today is I'm trying to, I'll tell you about how we can actually use epigenetics to discover and describe certain health threat trends within the human population. So a very prime example of this is work that's been done by Professor Marcus Pembry out of Bristol. And this is what we call the Ovacolix study. Um, Ovacolix is a small principle uh, in the northern part of Sweden. And they've kept very good records of the harvest conditions and the availability uh, of food to individuals at the time. Because of the small village, they also kept very meticulous and accurate health records. So what Marcus and his colleague Lars Brigand did was they went to the village and they pulled out all the information, the historical information about harvest, and they corresponded that to the health outcomes of three different generations. And the, the results were quite astounding in that they found that if a grandfather was undergoing puberty at a time of famine where food availability was scarce, his grandchildren were actually at higher risk of developing diabetes or actually uh, at, at a higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease as well. In, in, on the flip side, grandmothers who were born during that sort of time of food scarcity, they had granddaughters that were actually more resistant to diabetes. So that was a very interesting counterpoint uh, that, that was discovered. But this was one of the first um, population-based evidence that there that certain historical events and exposures could potentially impact the, on the health trajectory of future generations. Uh, for those of you interested, there's a, there's a documentary called Ghosts in Your Genes that's actually freely available on YouTube. So you can go and, go and watch that for more information from Marcus. Now, Sweden has since followed up on, on that study uh, in what we call the Uppsala study, uh, where they profiled 27,000 individuals across three generations. While they didn't find the exact outcomes of what Marcus did, they did find that the paternal, uh, nutri uh, paternal nutrition was actually correlated to the risk of certain cancers in the grandchild uh, generation. Right? And this is, uh, so this is an example of how, we, uh, while epigenetics certainly gives us a clue to what might be occurring, it doesn't give us the absolute answer. And that's really one of the driving motivations for a, a lot of us to conduct further research on a larger population scale. Um, there have been, uh, since then, there have been a couple of independent studies out of America that have suggested that uh, paternal obesity, or you know, one way to put it, uh, nutritional uh, availability, uh, is also correlated to uh, an increased risk of certain uh, cancers. So there's certainly a, a very much uh, growing field of research in, in this area. Now, a lot of effort has been placed on how maternal health uh, dictates uh, the health of children. Uh, in this one example here, you can see that weight gain during pregnancy is predictive of eventual birth weight. And we know that birth weight kind of in, is an indicator of your risk for diabetes and obesity later on in, in life. Uh, an interesting study that came out of Japan suggested that Pregnant women who had a, maintained a healthy um, dietary intake of fruits and vegetables and, and uh, foods that were high in antioxidants had toddlers who had fewer reported incidences of behavioral problems. So that's a very interesting uh, outcome um, in that the maternal diet can pr predict the behavior of their toddlers later on. 
But while a lot of work has been focused on maternal health, much less has been focused on the paternal contribution to um, the, the health outcomes of, of children. Uh, one of the big areas that has been uh, focused on is the, the uh, issue of paternal obesity. And we find that paternal obesity has a very direct and big effect on the adiposity and the, the fat accumulation in, in children uh, later on. It might have something to do with the home environment, obviously. Um, so preclinical models are really uh, crucial towards addressing some of those uncertainties. Uh, in the US, down in uh, uh, the University of Duke, they're focusing on some of the molecular markers of paternal obesity. And they've found that uh, in, in the sperm of uh, obese males, you can actually pick out a epigenetic signal that can actually predict whether the, the, the sperm donor was actually obese or not. So that's something to uh, certainly uh, keep an eye out in, the, in this space. The issue of paternal obesity is quite prevalent uh, and certainly uh, of much attention within Australia. And Australian research has contributed greatly to advancing that. So we have Professor Margaret Morris in the University of Sydney and Professor Michelle Lane in South Australia who have conducted many preclinical studies of uh, transgenerational obesity and how it impacts on liver, pancreas, and cardiac function uh, in future generations. So Australian research is certainly playing its role uh, uh, on, on an international stage. So I was more interested in how depression and anxiety uh, affected individuals. Um, as Mel Melanie, uh, uh, during her introduction, uh, mentioned, uh, I did my PhD in studying stress physiology and the genetic predisposition to depression. So, I, so as this field of transgenerational inheritance was emerging, I wanted to take a step in, in, in that direction as well. And I specifically wanted to ask the question, can paternal stress and trauma also leave a mark on our future generations? All right. And this is a, an, an image from a piece from the New York Times um, from just uh, in November of last year, where they've raised the profile of, of this sort of phenomenon uh, occurring, but they left a caveat in, so I don't know whether you can see it, but they claim that, but the evidence, at least in humans, is circumstantial at best. So what I'd like to do over the next few slides is to present you a couple of uh, events where we have actually observed transgenerational changes in human behavior. So the first um, case study that I'd like to present is a study held by Professor Rachel Yehuda at Mount Sinai uh, University in New York. And uh, what Rachel did was she observed um, Holocaust survivors who had and or didn't have PTSD. And she compared them to um, Jewish individuals within the greater Ohio uh, region that weren't exposed to the Holocaust. And what she found was that if a mother, a, Holocaust, a female Holocaust survivor who had PTSD, she was more likely to have children who also developed PTSD-like symptoms later on in life, despite themselves never being exposed to that same level of trauma. Um, they also found evidence that the stress response within, that you could measure from blood samples was also different in these individuals. And you could account for those differences based on the fact that their mothers had PTSD in relation to the trauma. Um, I think that, that population is really interesting because um, another issue that emerged uh, to potentially play a role in this, the, the emergence of PTSD in, in the children was overmothering um, as, as well. On the flip side, when she started looking at male Holocaust survivors who had PTSD, they were quite surprised to find that their children weren't as greatly affected. They still had differences in their stress response, but certainly the behavioral symptoms weren't quite as strong as the maternal influence. So this is a, this is a very nice example of how paternal, uh, parental trauma can potentially impact on the behavior of adult children. But it's still quite controversial because uh, different, different groups of scientists have argued that this is a very specific and special population. So Rachel has since gone on to study the individuals exposed to the World Trade Center attacks. So if you examine, so what she did was she recruited pregnant women who were within their third trimester at the time of the attacks 
And she has started to do, conduct a long-term study of the health and behavioral outcomes of their children. Already at nine months, when you actually measure the stress hormone levels in the saliva of their infants, these are actually at a lower level. They, later on, uh, when the toddlers uh, reach play school, they've also found to ex exhibit more visual signs of distress when they were separated from their mothers as they entered in, into the playgroup. And there is now evidence to suggest that the boys are starting to show more aggression and, and uh, aggressive behavior and behavioral issues in terms of emotionality as well. So they are at the stage of following up these children in middle school now. It will be very interesting to see how their academic outcomes and uh, other behavioral problems, uh, whether they exist or not. So another uh, case study comes from uh, Israeli uh, researchers, uh, primarily from individuals who were involved in the Yom Kippur War. And because Israel has a very unique situation where both men and women are uh, recruited into the army, they were able to study ex-POWs who were either males or females. And what they found is that overall, regardless, individuals who had PTSD as a result of being a POW had children who displayed and developed signs of um, behavior, uh, behavioral uh, issues despite themselves not being exposed to that same level of, of trauma. However, they have also found that being actively involved and being aware and educated about these potential problems and having an effective strategy in dealing with the emergence of these, these issues in young children was a very effective way of minimizing um, behavioral problems later on in school. So a little bit closer to home, the, um, there have been a couple of recent studies focusing on the children of Vietnam War vets. And Professor Brian O'Toole up in Sydney uh, published a few, st uh, a few studies whereby they found that there was a higher incidence of anxiety, drug-taking behavior, poorer uh, academic performance in the children of Vietnam War vets who had PTSD. Uh, in a more recent uh, study by Walter, Walter Forrest, uh, they uh, recruited a larger cohort of, of individuals, about approximately 2,000 of them, and they basically uh, described the same sort of uh, occurrence, whereby there was a greater likelihood of anxiety and depression in the adult children of Vietnam War vets who had PTSD. And this was basically uh, the foundational study that, com that uh, contributed to uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs investing a couple of hundred million, um, sorry, about approximately six million dollars in the Kookaburra Kids uh, program, which offers uh, children of um, war vets who have PTSD uh, into this sort of social interaction, sort of uh, a cognitive uh, stimulation uh, program for their children. So these couple of uh, incidents, uh, these couple of case studies basically emphasize the important nature of having to consider family history and the exposures of, of our parents and grandparents in uh, not only for our individual health, but also for future population health concerns. Again, Australia, Australian researchers are punching above our, our weight. Um, we now have clues uh, molecular clues uh, of uh, PTSD based on examination of the, the, the profile of sperm cells. And this is, uh, th these are studies coming out of Queensland, whereby if you extract uh, DNA from the sperm cells of, of war veterans, you are able to identify who is more likely to have, ha have experienced PTSD compared to those who didn't. Uh, and these are somewhat consistent with the international studies that have now started to occur, trying to describe these sorts of molecular and epigenetic uh, um, uh, traces that we can detect um, as a result of different traumatic exposures. Now, studying people is really hard. <laughs> and uh, there are some real-world challenges in dealing with population studies. Um, recruitment is, is difficult. You need to convince the individual to participate in your study. Um, however, not only that, individuals, we, as individuals, we deal with stress in very many different ways. Right? Whether we can internalize it well, whether we're more susceptible to stress, more resilient to stress, uh, 
whether we took uh, medication to, to deal with our stress. These are all variables that we need to factor in into studies, and that's, that imposes huge limitations uh, for us to, in terms of an, in interpreting the data. There are also other uh, factors, such as the home environment uh, during development, the availability of food, whether the food is of, of high nutritional value, um, whether you know, uh, tertiary education, for example, social economic status in, in general. Um, and lastly, you know, the collection, banking, and processing of all these biological samples that we would like to collect. So one way to get around all those logistical issues is to develop pre very solid and reliable preclinical models that can help us answer these difficult questions. So in terms of trauma, um, I'm going to give you an example of uh, a mouse model of, of trauma that is very widely studied. It's called the chronic social defeat stress model. And what it, uh, the principle uh, of it is you basically get a younger uh, subordinate mouse and expose it to an area that, is, uh, uh, that uh, a dominant male resides in. And what the dominant male is going to do is he's going to protect his territory and start attacking the younger male. So that is, uh, the, the attacks are what we term as physical stress. We can then separate the younger mouse uh, with a uh, perspex divider where it can still um, visually see its bully. And that's what we term as sensory stress. So this combination of stress applied on consecutive days uh, is sufficient to create a, a, a behavioral and a permanent behavioral change uh, in, in the bullied mouse. And what we see is that we, we see behaviors and, and responses that are very closely aligned to what we observe in the clinic. So for example, you see social withdrawal, social avoidance, the mouse is huddled in a, in a, in a corner. You see anxiety-like symptoms. You see anhedonia, where the mouse doesn't like to engage in activities uh, uh, that would otherwise normally present it as a pleasurable uh, source. Uh, you see some metabolic symptoms where uh, either their feeding uh, drops off or they're putting on weight abnormally. You start to see changes in their sleep cycles as well. Uh, the level of activity across the day, which should follow a regular pattern, is disrupted, just like uh, stress disrupts our sleep patterns. And you see changes in uh, the HP axis, which is basically the, the physiological system that regulates stress. So what that all those behavioral changes are in the, the, the stressed mice. So what happens in their children? Well, it turns out that this is a great model for, for, for studying intergenerational uh, inheritance because the children of these defeated mice, they show reduced sociability. So when you present them with a, a novel mouse partner, it chooses not to interact with that mouse partner. So that's some, akin to social withdrawal. Um, you see increased anxiety. So uh, the, the, the mice will choose to huddle in dark, closed uh, spaces rather than explore the open world. And you also see anhedonia. So when we present them with like a sugar sweetened solution, which uh, should be very palatable, they, they would rather not drink it. And overall, you see that the stress response uh, of both the male and female mice, again, keeping in mind that they were never exposed to any sort of trauma themselves, uh, trends downwards. And this is qu uh, quite akin to what we observe in, PTS, uh, in PTSD. Now, as much as we measure stress hormones as an indicator of how stressed we are, I need to emphasize that stress is really important for our, our being. It's really you know, in, important in having a healthy life. And that's because a, 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 a stress bas basically keeps us primed and alert throughout the day. Okay, so what you see up there is the concentration of stress hormone in our blood, and it follows a nice circadian pattern. So it's from a, from a high concentration as you're wake, waking up, it gradually drops down because you don't want to be too on edge during the day as you're going about your daily business. And as you're falling asleep, uh, it slowly rises up again. So this ha pattern happens on a daily uh, basis. And what we see in stressed individuals as they lose the, the regular pattern of sleep is that, that the, the, the peaks and troughs are basically gradually flattening out. Now, we all experience stress in one way or another on a very daily basis. They might come from different sources, uh, they may be, be of, of different severities and of different durations, but 
the, the inescapable fact is that we are all stressed on a daily basis. So the question I wanted to ask was, well, if we have evidence of uh, intergenerational effects of trauma, what does daily stress do for us? And the way we do this is we needed to create a model of generalized daily stress. So we started thinking about it. And the one thing that struck us was that the human stress molecule, cortisol, as you can see there, is remarkably similar to the stress hormone that is present in rodents. So what we did was we simply synthesized some stress hormone and we dissolved it in drinking water, which we could then feed to the mouse. And what we found was that when the mice are awake, and that's when they drink most of their water, you can see a nice increase in the blood levels of the stress hormone. But, it's not pre but it doesn't significantly affect the mouse when they're asleep. Um, having fed these mice for, or for a period of four weeks, what we do see is that uh, there is a reduction in their uh, peak stress response, which is what we'd, we'd expect to see. And why that occurs is because the body is physically adapting to experiencing stress on a daily basis. The adrenal glands, which reside right on top of the kidney that produce these stress hormones, are shrinking in response to uh, uh, all, all this uh, higher level of, of stress hormone. So it's a protective mechanism, that, uh, and that's one that's uh, very naturally occurring. Importantly for us, we saw no behavioral changes in these mice. And I really uh, appreciated that response because it showed that the mice could behaviorally adapt to that experience of stress on a, on a daily basis. And this is more indicative of what most of us in the general population and, and how we actually respond to stress in, in, in that way. So what we did, having established that, was we took these stress uh, animals we took the males, we bred them with females, and we got their kids. And then we started to profile the anxiety and depression sort of uh, uh, behaviors in their children. And what we found was, was rather shocking, uh, in that we found that the male offspring of these stress dads were more likely to display uh, increased anxiety levels, but their daughters were relatively spared. So this was a very sex-specific effect that we were noticing. We also found that only in the sons, they were having a different response when we stressed them themselves, in that their concentrations of stress hormone in response to the stress was actually elevated. And it took longer for them to get back to baseline. So it took them longer for them to recover. And this is quite consistent with what we see uh, in the clinic as well. And again, the female offspring were relatively unaffected. Now, it's, all, it's not all not, not doom and gloom because when we decided to uh, run a small experiment where we shortened the period of stress and we found that that had no intergenerational effect. So that is good. That is to get, that's a very positive message in that if we are able to manage our stress, be aware of the stress that we are facing and, and engage in activities and, and, and uh, the means to alleviate some of that stress, you can actually break that cycle of intergenerational uh, effects. And that's a very important message that we are trying to get out. Now, one thing, one benefit of working with, with rodents is that they have a much shorter gestational period. So we actually have, we are actually able to conduct a transgenerational experiment um, uh, in a relatively short period of time compared to decades that we might be, be looking at in, in terms of the human population. So we basically took the, the sons and we bred up the grandkids. And what we found was that there was still some sort of uh, effect of grandparental stress on the grandchildren. Uh, it was a bit surprising to see that the, the grandsons were actually less anxious, but they were more likely to develop depression when we stressed them themselves. Uh, quite surprisingly, the granddaughters were relatively unaffected uh, as well. So this starts giving us a, a clue that there's something going on across generations that seems to be more or less maintained within that, that male line. So we started looking at genes that are only inherited from your father, 
And one of these genes is actually something that I had put up, mentioned earlier uh, in terms of the paternal obesity study. Uh, it's called IGF2, and it's a growth factor. So what we, we decided to do was, all right, if you're actually inheriting this particular gene from your father and it's passed down to your grandchild, then the pattern of expression should be maintained. So we see that um, stress increases the level of IGF2 in sons. And when we actually look at the grandsons, that pattern is precisely preserved. So this gives us a really good clue as to how some of this uh, information transfer across generations might be happening. And the way that's going to happen is probably through sperm. And this is where I, my work, having been trained in neuroscience and physiology, really took a, a left turn. So I had to retrain myself in aspects of, of uh, reproductive biology. So we started looking at, at, at sperm cells. And what we did was, on the assumption or the hypothesis that this was an epigenetic mechanism, what my students did was they isolated and removed DNA from the other molecular content of the sperm cells. And then we started to look, well, what else is left? And what we found were these small molecules that were remarkably uh, increased in proportion called microRNAs. And before I get into the, the findings of that, I would say that when we started, when we made this discovery, we looked back in the published literature to our Swedish uh, and um, um, US colleagues. All the molecular changes that were occurring in sperm in all the other um, PTSD-like models were consistently microRNA. So we knew that we were on to the right thing. So what we think is that whether stress is applied to us early in life, throughout adolescence, during puberty, whether it is low-level stress, whether it's traumatic stress, there's going to be a proportional response in the numbers of microRNA that are changing in our sperm cells. And that is going to be a primary principal uh, reason for the transgenerational uh, effects and changes in behavior that we are observing. So this is a, a, a one of the key avenues of research that many of us are now taking. So what are microRNAs? Without getting into the pedantics of biochemistry, microRNAs are what are, are, I, li I like to describe microRNAs as essentially genetic speed humps. So it, it, it's like, uh, imagine if you have a, a bed, you bought a bed from IKEA, you had your instructions, and someone doused that instruction sheet with wax. That is essentially, the wax is actually doing what microRNAs do. It's preventing you from reading that sort of genetic instruction code that is occurring uh, in your body. And it turns out that microRNAs, besides playing an important role in um, a whole host of functions such as heart, heart function, cardiac function, uh, neuronal function, it also plays a very principal and essential role in reproduction. So if you artificially remove all the microRNA from sperm cells, you cannot get fertilization and you cannot get embryonic development. So, uh, interestingly, in, uh, in the last couple of years, microRNAs, turns out, is also uh, present in seminal plasma, and that is essential to prime the female environment for the implantation of the embryo as well. So there's a, there's, it, it, it's starting to appear like there's a very close connection between stress as well as fertility and some of these reproductive measures. So that led uh, us to formulate uh, the theory as to why stress can cause intergenerational shifts in behavior. And essentially what you have is, in the male reproductive tract, you have sperm cells that are growing and developing. Now, the cells lining the walls of, uh, of the reproductive tract are actually very highly uh, dense in stress hormone receptors. It turns out it's the second most highly dense uh, organ compared to the brain. So that, that's, uh, again, another hint as to how important a uh, relationship between stress and reproduction is. So what we think is that these cells release little uh, pockets of vesicles containing microRNA, which then fuse with the sperm cells as they go about their journey towards um, maturity. And some of the work um, that uh, is being done with my collaborator, uh, Professor Brett Nixon up in Newcastle, uh, quite nicely demonstrates that. So what Brett has done is to actually uh, 
insert a green fluorescent uh, marker on each of these little vesicles. And across a period of time as they're incubating the cells, you can see these vesicles fuse and enter into the sperm head itself. So what we're trying to do at the Flory, looking forward, is trying to exploit some of this information. And we're trying to use um, markers to try and identify precisely down to the single cell level whether a sperm cell is healthy or not, and whether it has been exposed to a stressful environment or not. Further application of uh, these. So another uh, uh, future direction that we're taking is to try and predict how stress can impact on early embryonic development. And as you can see here, these are some of the preliminary videos that we have started to, to gather. Uh, I'll leave it to you to try and predict which one might be a traumatized uh, embryo, if you can see. So that one, uh, that was an embryo that was dividing very nicely at regular intervals. And finally, you get that hatching. So that's the embryo there. And this one basically seized after about eight cells. So what we can do after that is with the viral embryos, we can actually color code these cells. We can actually count the number of cells that, uh, so the blue cells here will eventually form the fetus and the red cells will eventually form the placenta. So we can then take the next step towards predicting the birth weight of this, this uh, animal or even in, uh, the individual in the IVF clinic. So these are some of the applications that actually uh, have arisen from starting at, the, uh, at a neuroscience, uh, starting with a neuroscience project, asking a transgenerational question, and then you know, taking a, a slight uh, turn in, in, in our research uh, journey to trying to address some of the reproductive biology questions. So, uh, as I kind of mentioned, and, and you, you might get a, uh, have clued onto this, uh, conducting transgenerational research is quite a complex uh, question to try and address. Um, it's certainly my uh, personal uh, research projects have, have been a mix of both uh, reproduction um, uh, neuroscience, psychiatry, behavioral, uh, behavioral science, as well as physiology. Um, and you know, I've, I've only focused on one particular aspect, which is paternal stress and trauma. But there are certainly multiple paternal factors that we not need to start thinking about when we, are, when we uh, uh, address this, this topic. And these include uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's stress, whether it's diet, uh, which is very uh, big in, in terms of uh, Australian health. Um, our levels of physical activity or, or, being, or being sedentary, um, our exposures to drugs and our, our mindful um, uh, exposures to different uh, chemicals uh, as well. A lot of the evidence does seem to support the direct involvement of epigenetic changes uh, that are accumulating in sperm cells that can drive this sort of, this sort of uh, intergenerational effect. But really, at the end of the day, we are studying individuals. So we, the, uh, the studies have not really gone into what's happening to the brain of the sons and the grandsons that could give rise to these behavioral changes. And that's the, one of the key focuses uh, uh, of, of, the, of my group moving, moving forward. So paternal exposures can affect offspring and future generations in many different ways. Um, it can impact on their physical health. It can impact on their behavior and mental health. But potentially, we could be looking at issues to do with reproduction and fertility. And uh, we do have uh, studies going on looking at incidents of cardiovascular uh, disease as well as uh, diabetes emerging uh, in some of our models. Um, I've talked primarily about the work that uh, we've been conducting in the mouse. But um, intergenerational research is by no means limited to rodent studies. Uh, there are many examples of uh, research being conducted in flies, as well as uh, the C. elegans. The challenge when, when I started doing this research uh, almost 10 years ago was we would really try to mesh up the research fields of psychiatry and neuroscience, and basic neuroscience. But it turns out there's more information that we, we gather. It's going to, we are faced with the challenge of incorporating aspects of reproductive biology, as well as endocrinology. So, um, so certainly uh, one of the fun things about, uh, about doing the work that I do is having to engage in clinicians and basic researchers in all these other fields where you're constantly learning and exchanging ideas on, on a daily basis. So 
I just want to finish off by, by saying that as much of the work that's going on in the, the Flory is focused on animal models, uh, I constantly am reminded that we cannot lose sight of the, the, the issue at large, which is we're doing our research to, for the benefit of the human population. We're doing the research for the benefit of individuals. And it is their lives whom we're trying to touch in some small way or another. We don't know how long that work is going to take, but we certainly draw inspiration on knowing that our work might one day contribute to the betterment of health in general. Right? There are certainly specific groups that are, that are more affected, um, as well as certain populations, and we cannot lose, lose track of that. So hopefully um, through these public talks and, 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 and our engagement with the, with the public uh, uh, in, in, the, in the greater con uh, context, we're hoping that uh, to continue this sort of education and emphasize the need to, for the general public to be constantly updated and aware of the research that we're going, uh, the research that's really at the forefront uh, on, on, and at an international level. So we're, we're definitely trying to, to push ahead uh, in, in studies going on. Um, it's, um, you know, one, one way I like to look at it uh, uh, with, the, with the students who are always focused on their, on their individual uh, project is to really uh, talk about uh, the work that we do in, in a greater perspective so that the researchers themselves see value in the work uh, that, we're, that we end up publishing. So uh, with that, I would like to thank uh, all the other researchers who have helped me on, on, on this whole process. Um, I've certainly uh, not done all the work myself. Um, my students, uh, Annabelle is a PhD student who started all the uh, generalized daily stress model uh, work with me. She's now in uh, University of California uh, doing her postdoc. Uh, Katie was a master's student who was involved in some of the early uh, uh, stress response work. Uh, and uh, I work under the auspices of the epigenetics and neuroplasticity lab that's headed by Professor Anthony Hannon. So I'm really appreciative of being able to do that research uh, with him. Um, I've got various collaborators as well, um, and I really uh, am thankful of them for having taught me all the aspects and the individual details of reproductive biology that have certainly enhanced my work. So I will leave it at that. Thank you for your attention.